Hi guys. How's it going? Homework is due tonight at midnight. Don't be confused by UTC on edX. The time on edX is like in UTC time. What, what's that? What's that? I think it says like 4 a.m. I would just ignore it. It's due at midnight. <laughs> um, and we keep it simple. Everything is always due at midnight. Um, yes? What's that? Yeah, we're looking for um, essentially a written mathematical argument for proving that the heuristics are admissible and consistent. What's that? Mathematical, right. So um, if you look in the book, there's actually an example of, of what it means to, to, uh, of a proof um, that A star is optimal. And it basically, um, you want to prove that for, to, pr to prove that it's admissible, you want to prove that it never underestimates the costs to, to the goal. So you can basically derive um, like this kind of inequality um, of, the, of the true cost of the goal and the heuristic cost. And, and and maybe construct somehow um, ha a, a way of, of um, showing this bound, basically, on, on the two costs. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, you can write text. Um, and then we'll be grading it manually. Yeah. Is there like a formal format that we need to use for that? Um, you should, I mean, if you look in the book at some of the proofs in the book, it kind of you know, gives this like theorem and, and you know, for each statement, you should give a justification of, of why it's true, and then the chain of arguments should 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 um, prove this bound. Yeah, Lee. Yeah, yeah. We would it'd be much easier for us if you can put it on edX. More questions? So anything? The project is out, so you should definitely take a look. Take some time to like start to, to, to code it up and, and stuff. Um, other things? All right. So today the we're gonna spend time talking about local search. But before we do, I kind of wanted to go back to like our our algorithm uh, for all of AI, and and sort of uh, see think of a little bit about where we've come and where we're going. Right. So. So we talked about uninformed search strategies. So, so what were those called? The uninformed search strategies that we did? A few lectures ago. I know it was a long time ago, but <laughs> what's that? Yeah, breadth first search and depth first search, right? So, so um, basically ways to like kind of go through all the different actions we could take. We didn't really worry about the score. We just had some kind of goal test. Um, and, and when we got to the goal, we were happy, right? We, we stopped our search. And then last class we talked about informed search strategies, right? So that was uh, what was what were those algorithms called? There was there was three we talked about: Dijkstra, Greedy, and A star. That's right. Um, and A star is kind of like the the sort of bread and butter of search algorithm that's used in a lot of different applications because the heuristic can provide so much powerful guidance about what direction to to uh, go uh, in your search. So that's starting to think about what that scoring function looks like and how it informs the order that we search uh, through those actions in, uh, in, our, in our sort of big agent uh, that's driving around and, and trying to do stuff. So um, I wanted to also, I, I feel like the stuff about heuristics can get confusing. And so I wanted to kind of review that before we, we dig into the local search. So this is like the eight puzzle again. Um, and we sort of talked about admissible and consistent. So does anybody um, want to tell me what admissible heuristics are? Yeah, they never overestimate the cost of the goal. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? We're never going to say it's, it's uh, more expensive than it really is. Um, so it might be less than it really is, and that's okay. It means that A star is going to look, but when it sees how much it really costs, it's going to be like, OK, I'm going to go check out some, some, somewhere else. Um, but if I overestimate, then I might not find, I might, go, I might not explore a path that's actually the optimal path, because there's an overestimate. All right, so what is consistent? Yeah. 
Yeah, right. So in words, it's basically relating the heuristic values among different nodes, right? So it was this triangle inequality. I think I have it, yeah, up here, right? So h of n is less than or equal to c of n, a n prime plus h of n prime. Okay, so it's this relation between the heuristic cost at one node, the actual cost, the real cost on the graph to go from one node to the next node, plus the heuristic cost at that, at that other node. So you can have A star be optimal well, with both. You have to do a little bit of extra bookkeeping if you have an admissible but not consistent heuristic. Um, and the proof in the book for, for, so somebody asked me last time about A star and proving that it's optimal. The proof in the book that the book gives relies on consistency uh, as a criterion because it kind of makes the math work out better. You're basically proving that at every step in the search, A star has always found the optimal path between the start and that node in the search. Um, and it relies on this triangle inequality to make that happen. Okay. Um, so here is our uh, eight puzzle again. And, and we sort of talked about these two uh, examples last time. So the total number of misplaced tiles and the total uh, Manhattan distance. Um, so so the, are these admissible heuristics or not? Yeah, we did it last time, right? They're admissible heuristics. So. And you can see that by like in, in, in intuition, kind of by saying, well, the, the true the true estimate, the true uh, cost to get to the goal is going to be a lot of moves. The total number of mis, misplaced tiles is going to be swapping. It has to be less, right? I can sort of say that intuitively. Um, in, in in math, you 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 kind of want you want to basically formalize that argument, right? And try to write down how many steps it's going to take to solve the problem and and, and why just swapping the tiles is is easy. Does that kind of, does that help maybe a little? All right. Um, and then we talked about uh, an example of an admissible but inconsistent heuristic. So here's one where it's, it's randomly picking some tiles and then using the Manhattan distance of these different sets of tiles. So that breaks the triangle inequality because if at one node you pick one, two, and three, the other node you pick four through nine, the triangle inequality might not hold. I mean, it might not even be the same heuristic value at each node when you, when you call them multiple times. So weird things could, could happen. Um, but it's actually pretty hard to come up with admissible but not consistent heuristics. It doesn't come up very much. Um, OK. So what I wanted to talk about now was kind of coming up with these heuristics. And this is where like the kind of maybe black magic um, happen. So what we're going to talk about today, like you kind of you kind of have to be creative, and sometimes they seem very weird. Um, you know why? It, it, it can be unclear why they do what they do and where they're where they're coming from. On your project, you're going to be asked to come up with heuristics for for Pac-Man, um, and I want to kind of give a general framework for for doing that. And th and this idea to come up with um, admissible heuristics is basically the um, you try to come up with relaxed problems. Does anybody know what a relaxed problem is? Right, you make it simpler. So you, you, you try to find, so here's the original eight puzzle problem. A tile can move from square A to B if A is horizontally or vertically adjacent to B, so they have to be next to each other, and B has to be blank. Um, and, and what you can do to, to find relaxed versions of this problem is remove some of these requirements, okay? Um, and, 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 and then every time you remove a requirement, you can get, uh, or different combinations of requirements, you can get a, a different heuristic. Um, so, so here's one version. A tile, uh, a tile can move from square A to B if A is adjacent to B. So, so B doesn't have to be blank, right? And it's okay if two tiles are, are um, two tiles are in one square. So, so this is easier than the original problem. Why? Yeah, we're removing a constraint. There's a lot more moves that that that, that are allowed. Um, you can just basically say, well, if I'm if I if I've got tile one, I, I can just sort of deterministically decide I'm going to go I'm going to move it to its goal, and, and I don't have to like swap other tiles or mess up tiles. I can just go plop 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 plop, and it's at it's at its goal, right? It's a much easier version of this problem. And the reason it's easier is it's very fast to find the solution. You don't have to search to find the solution. Or the search is like very, you know, algorithmic almost. Like it's, it's maybe, maybe you could call it a search, but like it's like this very algorithmic thing that you're doing to, to compute the, the answer. Um, so what heuristic does this correspond to? Yeah. 
It's one of the ones from the previous slide. Manhattan distance, right. So, so, so the cost of, of um, solving the, the problem, in, in this, uh, of solving the relaxed problem, is basically the Manhattan distance of all the tiles uh, from their current location to the goal. Does everybody see that? Right, so I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna move my tile up and over and up until it gets to the goal. I'm gonna do that for each tile. That's the summed Manhattan distance. So I relax the problem and I get the Manhattan distance estimate. Um, so let's, we'll talk about this one in a second. So what about this one? A tile can move from square A to square B. What's that? Yeah, right, right. I can just like take a tile and just put it on its goal. You know, I just move it to where it needs to go. Um, so, so just walk through every single tile, put it where it needs to go, and I'm done. All right. So, what heuristic does this correspond to from our previous slide? H1, right, the number of misplaced tiles, right? So I, I made this relaxed problem where I'm allowed to teleport tiles, um, and, and uh, the cost of solving the relaxed problem becomes the heuristic in the real problem, OK? So of this one and this one, which one's easier? Which one's less to, co less to solve, less cost to solve? The bottom one, right? I'm swapping things, right? Um, so, so it's it's um, you know, it's an even smaller estimate of the of the true cost. Which heuristic worked better? Remember, we had some. I, I think I, I think I showed it at the end of class. Which one do you think is going to work better in the real problem, though, of those two? The top one. Why? Yeah, it's a tighter bound. Okay, so we're still not going to overestimate. It's an easier problem, and we're not going to overestimate, but we're going to underestimate by less. So that's going to give A star more information to uh, use as it's deciding which nodes to expand. And that's going to enable it to search more efficiently. OK, so now I want you guys to think about this one, this middle one that we skipped before. So a tile can move from square A to B if B is blank. So the idea is like you, you can teleport a tile. You don't have to be next to it, but it has to move into a, a blank. I want you guys to take a couple of minutes to talk amongst yourselves. There's a heuristic that corresponds to uh, this, this, uh, this relaxation. It's called Gaffnig's heuristic. And I want you to talk amongst yourselves a, uh, a little bit and try to think about what you would do to compute a heuristic uh, around this one, this middle one. Go. So about 10 more seconds. All right, finish up. All 
right, who wants to share? This was, I think this is a little tricky, uh, but I think it's good to think about it, even if you didn't get it. Yeah? Eight steps? Um, so, so, so how would you compute the heuristic value in a state? Uh-huh. Yeah. That's right. So that would be half of eight steps all Right, right. But it's gonna depend on how many are misplaced, right? Yes. Right. So so does that so did everybody hear that? Like like basic the the, the, the high level algorithm for computing this heuristic is you're gonna stick something in the blank tile uh, take take like if take the one slot, let's say. And let's say there's some other tile there. You're going to put whatever tile that is in the blank spot, wherever it is. Like, let's say the blank spot's not at 1. Um, and then you're going to take 1 from wherever that is and put it on the first one. And then do the same thing for number 2. You know, move something else to the blank spot and move 2 to the blank spot. Right? There's an algorithm. This is from uh, um, the internet. But um, this is sort of a uh, pseudocode of this, right? So for everything. Um, that isn't in the goal position, swap the blank around, and then uh, if the blank is in the goal position, and then put, put the right thing in that position, and then otherwise swap the blank with the match tile. So you're kind of swapping through. Does that make sense? Yes? Do we know which tiles match the blank position code? And we don't have to do this, like, swap blank and thing, but can't we do that, or right? like, can we yeah. Yes, right. So, so, so then you don't have to like do those extra swaps, and then you get a tighter bound, and you get a better heuristic. So that's good. Um, so this is sort of a simple uh, trying to be short and concise, but not getting all of the tricks that you can get to, to get better performance. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends, right? So this heuristic has got like a while loop in it, right? It might take a long time to run the heuristic, and that might kill you, right? If your heuristic, what's, what's like the best possible heuristic? Yeah, one that exactly mirrors the actual cost of the goal. How could you compute that? What's that? Without a heuristic, like, you know, how could you compute that? What's that? Yeah, DFS, right? Dijkstra. You could just do something with uninformed search, get the actual true cost of the goal, plug it into A star, and A star is going to fly, right? It's going to have this, you know, great information about where it should go. But the heuristic cost is going to take a long time to compute. Um, so there's a trade-off um, when you're coming up with these heuristics. Um, and a lot of the games people play are things like maybe I can cat, maybe I can do that, maybe I can run DFS but run it offline, or somehow predict. The true cost um, from lots of runs of, of breadth first search that I did offline and then use it online in A star or something uh, in order to run faster. Yes? Yeah, so, so maybe it's a little confusing because there's no. Um, uh, yeah, so so it's so 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 there's no like function um, returning stuff, but um, it so so the, the intuition behind this idea of relaxed problems is that a solution to the exact problem is a heuristic for the re the original problem, so it is kind of doing both at the same time. Um, in this in, in this example, um, it's it's coming up with the, the the sequence of swaps, and if I outputted the sequence of swaps and ran it, I would have a solution to that relaxed problem. Right? I would just be able to run that and, and get a solution. But the cost of that solution is the heuristic value. So here, it's doing these swaps, and it's doing some bookkeeping to kind of keep track of the additional swaps it needs to do. But what it's returning is the number of moves, okay? the cost of that solution. And that is what you would use in your heuristic in the original problem. Yeah, in the original problem that you actually care about. Um, does that kind of make sense? OK. So why don't you guys um, do, we'll do a, a, another uh, sort of seat exercise. I want you guys to um, in, in pick, pick somebody sitting next to you, maybe the, somebody on the other side of you than, than last time, and come up with a problem and define a heuristic. Um, and ideally, come up with like a relaxed version of your problem, and then, uh, and then
and then and then uh, discuss a heuristic for that. If you don't, if you can't think of it, you, you can think of your own problem. Here's an example of a robot problem. You're trying to find a path for the arm, this arm, to pick up this cup. Um, so, so take a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll share our problems and heuristics with the class. All right, finish up. All right, guys, who wants to share your problem and then your heuristic? Maybe a relaxed problem and then the heuristic for it. Yeah. So we decided to work on this problem up uh -huh. here. Um, and we decided that the relaxed problem would be you don't need to worry about like the joints of the arm. It can mm -hmm. just move the hand directly. Mm -hmm. um, so the heuristic we came up with is just you know, the straight distance between the hand and the mm -hmm. cup. Good. Yeah, so like, and then as the hand gets closer, you're hoping that the joint trajectories are gonna, are gonna somehow be better. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. So like, let me try to draw a picture, see if, we get, if I get it. So you're trying to, to, to find, here's tra traveling salesman, right? You're trying to find a path that visits all of these cities and, and doesn't do, and visit, it doesn't visit any of them more than once. And then your heuristic is to compute a minimum spanning tree, so that's like kind of easy in this graph. And then say the length of the nodes in the tree. Right, because 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 the true path, like like if you do that, you might end up. I, I'm trying to construct an example where that's not just the answer. Um, put another one in here. How's that look? So a, a minimum spanning tree would be like going from here to here to here to here to here to here, right? Yeah. Oh, you're returning your Okay, that makes it harder. Yeah. Right, right. So then you might have to do some weird things to skip over nodes to leave yourself a path back. Right. Uh, but the minimum spanning tree is a relaxed version, and, and, and it might be better. Good. Who else? Yeah. Rubik's cube. Rubik's cube. 
Let's, let's talk about Rubik's Cube. So Rubik's Cube, what's the... Uh-huh. So the, so the true cost would be like how many turns I've got to do. Everybody know where your Rubik's cube is? There's like this square. Let's do this. And there's like these little squares on the square, and they're all different colors, like this. And you get to rotate, and they're all like this. And you get to rotate aside, and your goal is to make them all, all the, all the squares be the same color as you as you kind of rotate. So each move is like a rotation. Um, and your estimated cost of solution is, is the, number of face, the number of tiles that are on the wrong face. Yeah, yeah in a, like a relaxed version. Very good. Yep. Nice. Maybe one more? Yeah. You got like the pancake foot problem thing where it's like um, you have a stack of pancakes of various uh -huh. sizes and you have to get them right. Um, it keeps the size order and then flips the bottom. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's an easier version of the problem. So, so, so the cost of doing, and then you could just directly flip them, right? Like, yeah. So you can just kind of see how you could compute that solution. Um, very good. Uh, so that's good. So you guys kind of get the sense of like the uh, tricks. It's like a heuristic for computing heuristics, right? Like coming up with these relaxed problems, um, and then uh, figuring out how to quantify that. And and you know, it's kind of a trade-off. Like a lot of times when we're we're trying to figure out how to solve uh, these problems. Uh, so we, we, we kind of do this kind of brainstorming, just like you guys just did, um, where we try to think of different heuristics. We try them. We talk about them. We see whether we think it would work. Um, and then we try something else. And we you know, try a bunch of things until, until you get to something that's actually going to be good. You're going to have the experience doing this whole process all the way down to code in your, in your project. Um, so this is just a little taste. All right. So now what we're going to do is switch gears a little bit. Um, who's heard of the birthday paradox? Most of you. So this, this is a paradox that says that if you have a sufficiently large number of people in the room, it's very likely that some of there'll be at least one pair that shares a birthday. This is the formula for computing it, and this is a graph of, of the probability. So I'm going to give you guys, so, so how many people are in the room right now, do we think? How many? I think between 70 and 80. I, I counted just before. What's that? So, so we're like, you know, we're definitely both 70. We're like way up here. So it's highly likely that in this room right now, there's at least one pair that shares a birthday. So I want to give you guys a search problem right now. Try to find the person whose birthday, the, the pair, a pair, if there's one, who shares the birthday. We're going to do this for like five minutes. You're probably going to stand up and walk around. <laughs> All right, that was awesome, guys. <laughs> that was great organization. So, so what I wanted to do was discuss the search strategy that we used to solve this problem. Um, both the one that we actually used, which is not the one I thought you would use, and, and other possible strategies we could use, and then try to discuss the differences between them to motivate our local search.
So what strategy did we end up using? What was our state space? Yeah? Right, we hash, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we hash everybody by birthday month, right? So our state was sort of what month we're on, right? That's the first state. And then, and then the second state is sort of what day we're on. And we also had to keep track of something else, right? What's that? I heard somebody say matches. Matches, yeah, right. We had to keep track. Because like, if we were just you know, didn't keep track of like, who had already said their birthday, we wouldn't have known that there would have been a match. So we had to keep track of the, the month and the days in order to detect the, uh, the, the uh, equality. And what was our actions in our search space? Somebody was shouting out, raise your hand, right? So, so, so who was doing that? You. So what was that? What, that was an action, right? Like that was a search action. You said, everybody who's, whose birthday is in January, raise your hand. So that was one type of action. What was the other type of action that we did? Distributedly. What's that? Compared. Yeah, everybody shouted out their, their day, and then they compared. Um, and, we found, and we found our match pretty quickly. It's pretty cool. All right, so that was kind of like um, this, this uninformed search, right? We didn't really come up with a heuristic for it. We just were smart about the way, very smart, about the way we defined the search space, or you, I should say, because I just watched. Um, the, you, you know, we, we did this in this really cool way where it was very flat and parallel. The, only, the depth was is at most two, right? We went from month to day, and then we backtracked up, and we went down to the next month and day. Did we do breadth first or depth first search? Yeah, we went depth first search. We went all the way down to, to the leaf nodes, and then we went back up and, and, and then went down to the, next, to the next leaf node. Why didn't we do breadth first search? Yeah. Yeah, it's too much memory for our brains to hold to hold on to at the same time. Okay, so now I want you to imagine that we had done this in a different way. This is actually the way I thought you would do it. Um, you guys, you guys outsmarted me. So, so what's another? Maybe just like tell me other ways you could have done it. Yeah. Yeah. So you could have had somebody call out every day of the year, and then and then see if there was if there was um, a match in that way. Um, what what is, what is, what's something even more decentralized? So like, let's think of an algorithm or approach that you would have used if you couldn't shout out to the whole room. Like, what if I had told you to do this? Maybe or I don't know. Somehow that you couldn't communicate to everybody in the whole room. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Have each person go to everybody else in the class until pairwise. They identified the per, uh, a person with, with a, uh, the same birthday. OK. So, so what we're going to think about today, and it's actually really great the way you guys come up with this, because we have this nice contrast. You can kind of imagine what that would be like, like this kind of crazy, everybody's walking around and talking to each other until all of a sudden somebody shouts out, we've got the same birthday, um, and, and we solved the problem. Um, we're going to talk about uh, algorithms based around this idea. OK. So, so the, the, the sort of the difference of the situation where you've got global control, you can shout out to the whole room, and you can get people to follow your instructions, and you can sort of expand the state space in a systematic way, versus these local methods where you don't really have that, that global view. And the best you can do is talk to people near you and, and collect information uh, in that way. Okay? So when we talk about local search, we're going to talk about that second scenario. Um, and it's actually true in a lot of situations. Like you do, you do, it's expensive and difficult to get that global view of, of what's going on. You can, and you can be very successful um, by applying these uh, local methods. So we're going to talk about some examples of this. So this is an example of, um, so we talked about using heuristic search for, For that uh, path planning problem on the robot, let me go back to the, to the robot picture. So, so where are the arms going to go, and what joint angles are, are, should they be? Um, and I think you guys suggested the, this distance between the arm and the goal. Um, but what turns out is that it, a lot of times, we don't really care if we say we don't really care anyway, if the arm has found an optimal trajectory. So like, let's say that there's a trajectory they both, you know, re there's two different trajectories. One takes a second to, you know, execute through the joint angles, 
And one link goes way out here and comes down. But at the end, it still closes around the cup and then picks it up. Okay. At the end of the day, the robot has picked up the cup. And we may not care that much. I mean, it'd be a little better if it was shorter and stuff, but we may not care that much if it's longer uh, versus not longer. And our algorithm for finding that, that optimal trajectory might take way, way longer than an approximate algorithm that finds a local trajectory. Um, so people use uh, these RRTs, uh, these kind of sampling-based algorithms, this is one version of a local search algorithm, in order to, to do this, to find these approximate solutions. Um, and we're going to talk about this uh, today, this kind of framework for, for doing this. I thought I saw a question. Did I, was I? No. Okay. All right. And, and, and like, this is like a 2D space. In the, in the real robot arm space, there's like four or five different joints. So you do a multidimensional RRT. This is a 3D RRT, but you'd have like a 4 or 5D. That's kind of trying to find these trajectories of joint angles. It doesn't matter if it's optimal as long as it gets from where I am to where the robot arm wants to be at the end. Um, OK. And the sort of way to, to think about what we're, the trade-off that we're making um, when we do this is we're sacrificing the path to the goal. Okay? So when we're doing um, A star or breadth first search, if you remember, we were keeping track in our code, we were keeping track of the sequences of nodes that we visited to get from here to the goal, um, the path uh, from the start to the goal. But we don't always care about it. Do, do we care about it in our birthday problem? No, it didn't really matter that we were in the January state and we did all those days and then the February state. The only thing we cared about was, I think it was February 11th? Yes. The only thing we care about is February 11th, and maybe the two people who, who got to raise their hand uh, for having that birthday. All right? Um, so, so by giving up on having the path, we're going to sacrifice our guarantees of optimality and stuff. But we can often uh, solve or get some kind of solution, may not be an optimal solution, in much bigger state spaces um, using these techniques. And they can almost, um, we talk about the actual, we get down to actually coding them up. You, you can see, you'll see that like, the, the code is almost embarrassingly stupid. Like it's just going to kind of wander around randomly and try different states until it gets to a, a good answer. Um, but it's the basis of a lot of very powerful algorithms. So I think it's, it's worth talking. All right, so our example problem for, for this is going to be the n queens problem. So the basic idea is that you're, you have a chessboard, and you're trying to get to find a configuration where all the queens are on the chessboard, and none of them are attacking each other, according to the rules of chess. So according to the rules of chess, a queen can move up and down any number of squares and diagonally any number of squares. So this queen can move here, 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 there. Maybe I'll use my laser pointer. There we go. Or it can move there, 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 or there, or it can go up and down. So down there, up, 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 and up, up, or right, left, 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 right, 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 right. OK? So, and the goal is to find a configuration of these pieces where none of them are attacking each other. OK? So, so is this uh, board such a configuration? No. Why? Corners. Yeah, there's corners, right? So, th so this queen. This queen up here is attacking this queen way down there, all right? Um, and we're going to use local search. Uh, okay, little arrow. Yay. Um, we're going to use local search to try to, to, try to solve this problem. Um, and, and the basic idea is we're going to, so, so here's like this drawing the different queens that are attacking each other. Um, we're going to try to do this greedy algorithm. It's, it's like the greedy uh, algorithm we did with uh, A star search. Uh, in the lead up to, to A star. And we're just going to try to find a new configuration where there's one less conflict. So the cost here is the conflicts, the number of conflicts. So here there's one, two, three, four, five. Um, they're going to move that queen up. It's going to go away. And then move another queen out. And, and that one's going to go away. And then you've got a solution. Um, OK. So the algorithm we're going to use is called hill climbing. Um, and this is the pseudocode for it. It's really short. So what's this algorithm doing? Not a trick question. 
So what's like the first make node thing doing? Kind of making it into a search graph, right? And then what? Does anybody want to say in words what that loop is doing? Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's right. So it's going to kind of bumble around in the search space, um, and 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 sort of you know go downhill until it gets to a place where everything is happy. That's going to stop. OK, so we're going to do this. Um, so here, maybe I'll make my slides get smaller. So first of all, can you guys all see the code? So first of all, let's look at our formalization of the problem. So here's nqueens.py. Um, I did this before class. So the idea is that we have um, a matrix representation of where the queens are in the chessboard. So like I'm passing uh, a 5x5 five five board here, and this is the location of the queens in the board. And then uh, we're doing this uh, enumeration. So we're moving all the queens around um, in different states. So this is getting the, the, the children. Um, you can kind of imagine like the, these uh, uh, down here, we're, we're kind of going i minus 1, i plus 1, j minus 1, j plus 1 to get the children and, and, and doing this in like a nested loop to get all of the, the different moves. And then we have this attacks predicate, which is a bunch of little math to check if a queen is attacking another queen. So I'm not going to, don't feel like you have to understand like uh, everything that's going on there, but like that's just so that you know that there's this test to see if something's attacking something else. And then there's a cost. So for the cost, um, down here, we're going to iterate through every pair of queens and check if they're attacking. So we're going to call that a tax predicate. Um, OK. So now we're going to do our, our hill climbing thing. So this is like our, our stub. Uh, yeah, it says def hill climb. It takes us input the state. So let's print out. Let's run it. Um, well, that's bad. Oh, okay. So it's, I figured out why it's returning that. So let's um, return state so we don't, we don't get an error. Um, so right now, it's just going to print its state out. And it got an error because I wasn't returning anything. So now, what should I do to implement this algorithm? I can put the pseudocode back up. What's the first thing I'm going to do? Do I have to do the make node thing? Or am I all set with my state class? I heard somebody say something. Say it louder. What's it? Yeah, we're all set. Like We've got this class. Um, I showed it to you. It's got successors. It's got a cost method. So I've got my thing encapsulated in a nice little search, search space. So now what do I want to do? A loop. Yeah, right. Good. OK. So while true, what do I want to do? Yeah, get the successors. So successors equals state dot successor. So how do I get the neighbor? What's that? Yeah, right. So I could do that. I'm going to do a for loop instead. But same thing. I could I could pop them off and like I was doing for breadth first search. But I can just do for successor in successors state dot successors. Now what? Yeah, to compare the values, right? So how am I going to do that? Somebody else. Yeah. Uh 
Uh-huh. Right. So best value equals, what should I initialize it to? Yeah, the first state. That's good. For successor in state dot successors. Um, now what do I do? If. If what? If. Then what? I think I have to say friend. Then what? Replace. Yeah, so, so why, so somebody said return. Do we want to return the successor or do we want to keep going? Keep going, right? Like we could return. I mean, the, the way these algorithms work is you kind of run until you get bored and then stop. Um, and getting bored can be defined in a number of ways. Um, one of the most common is, is let's run it a thousand times and then stop. Um, another way is you can check for convergence. So you'll see if the best value that, I at, that I'm at hasn't really changed in a while, then stop. Um, but if things are keeping getting better, then I'll keep, I'll keep running. Um, so in this, we're, in this mode, we're just never going to stop. We're going to go forever. So if successor.cost less than equal to best value than cost, best value equals successor. What do we think of this? Like I don't need this guy because I did inside the loop. Undefined name successor. Oh, two S's. All right. Now what? Yep. Yeah, that's good. Yes. So I want to start out where I am and, and sort of go from there. Yeah, so I need to do something outside of this while loop to make this work, right? So, so I'm doing, so, so what it's saying is, uh, so, so, so there's like the outer while loop that's actually in the pseudocode, and then there's the inner for loop, which they just used words to describe, but we actually had to write a for loop to make that happen, right? So I think what we should do is say best value equals state outside, um, best value. So at the end of this for loop, <coughs> let's print out best value. Um, we really, what do we have in the pseudocode? What variable is inside of best value? The, the neighbor, right? Yeah, some nods, some people looking confused. I'll type down the code, maybe that will help. <laughs> neighbor equals best value. All right, we didn't actually define our neighbor yet. So now we're going to swap out. So let's make a current. Current equals state. So we save our input around. We'll say current equals best value. And maybe we'll, we'll run, we'll try that trick for i in range 10. And then we'll return current. What do you guys think of this? Yeah? Should we run it? No? OK. All right, so let's try to see what it's doing. Maybe I'll just have it run. I'll do a raw input so it'll stop. Um, and what we did, maybe I'll print start state. So our start state, is there a, so, so it's basically, my microphone dropped. It's basically putting, in this matrix, it's putting a 1 for where the queens are and zeros for, for other places. So in our start state, I'm circling with the mouse up there, are there conflicts or no conflicts? Yep. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. I think there's only 4. There are 4. It's a five by five grid, right? So one, two, three, four, five. Um, we can do it, so we could pass more queens in. If you have enough queens, it's impossible to solve because there's no configuration. 
Um, so there's four queens and, and a five by five grid. So is there, so in this state, is there a conflict? Yes. Yes. Where's one? Yeah, there's two in the center right there, in the, in the middle. Right. Um, so then uh, the current state looks like it's the same. So let's go. Um, no, they dropped. Oh, they dropped? Yeah. What happened? Right oh, good. All right. Yes. OK, see? It dropped this one down here. Um, so is that good? Yeah, so kind of why did it do that? If this one went from here down to here. What, why was that good? Yeah, it reduced one of these conflicts, right? So this, these two right here were conf in conflict, and now they're not. What's, and the row is in conflict, too, right? So they got rid of two conflicts. That was good. Um, so this, is it hand raised? No. OK, let's do it again. Um, now what? Are we, oh, are we at a local max? So it's only allowed to move by one at a time. And I think if we check, every one move is, is at a conflict. So, so this is bad, right? Maybe. Ah, yes, you are right. Somebody said that before, too, right? So let's try. OK, so, so we did the same thing as before. Let's, do it. let's hit Enter again. Oh, look, it did something different. Right, so we moved this one over here. But it's still in conflict, yeah. So it's kind of looking around. So we don't know. Like, it might be that it's in a local maximum. It might be because there's still a bug in the code that we just wrote. What's that? It moved again. It moved again. Let's keep going. Look at this. Yay. So it's going to keep crying. Look, it's going <laughs> to. So everybody see what's happening now? We, we hit a no conflict state. What we can actually do is print best value dot cost. We can actually see what the cost is. Let's do that. So four, two, zero. See that? And we actually got to, and then we ran ten times, so we exit. Um, so it doesn't actually know when it when it hits exit. You could in this problem because we know the structure, we could say, well, if the cost is zero, you can exit. Um, and you might be able to exit sooner, but you don't always know the value of the lowest cost solution. Um, so we'll talk about that uh, in, in the next example. Uh, and, and OK, so we kind of see the, the, the bad in our debugging, right? Like we got to this point where we weren't sure if it was going to stop or, or not stop um, and, and still be in a state with conflict, right? So, so that's called, does anybody know what that's called? You get to the state where like it kind of stops going down, but maybe there's another solution that's even better. Local, local, I heard somebody. Local max or local min, yeah. So we, you might reach, in this, in this algorithm, you might get to a point where you reach a local optimum value, but that's far from the global optimum value. The search is just going to be stuck. It's never, it's going to stick, it's, it's like everywhere I go looks worse than where I am right now, so I'm never, I'm never going to leave that, that local um, optimum value. But what's good about this search method? Yeah. Yeah, we just went boom, 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 boom. You know, we went right to a solution. Um, and, and problems where there's lots of potential solutions, where we don't care so much in n-queens, we don't care so much about the moves we have to make to get to the solution. We just care about finding the solution. Um, so it doesn't matter if we find it takes us a little longer to get there um, uh, versus not. We don't, and we don't care if it's uh, the, about the path if it's twisty or weird or whatever. Uh, um, so in, in problems where you can get a good heuristic, you get a good structure, you can just go right down that gradient and get to a really good place really quickly. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Um, right, so I guess we also, we all get stuck in local optima when we <laughs> are debugging our code and we can't figure it out. And then you kind of, but well, what do you do when you get stuck in a local optimum when you're debugging your code? 
or something. Is that the end? Are we are, we, are, are humans just stuck in local Atoma forever? And maybe we are. Yeah, you pick another start point. Right. What else can we do? That's really good. What's that? Yeah, I might decide, well, even though it's worse than where I am, maybe I'll go there anyway. You know, maybe it leads somewhere good. I have to go through a dark and scary forest, but on the other side is like the Emerald City, right? Um, so I might decide to, to not, uh, to make some, some stops that aren't so good. Um, so, so those are the, the uh, moves are basically random restarts, and, and that one is actually critical. So I was doing a version of this algorithm for a research paper once, could not get it working, spent like weeks and weeks trying to figure out what was wrong, and my friend said, yeah, you've tried random restarts, and I did, and all of a sudden they started to work. Um, so, so having it run in different places can be, can be really good. Um, and then also random sideways or even up moves. So random sideways moves, well, we saw it doing that, right? Like it was kind of flipping around in other places where the cost was the, was the same. Um, but we might even want to do more than that. We might want to do random up moves. Um, and that gives us to another algorithm, which, we're, which basically tries to, to do this in a, in a semi-principled way, I'll say. Um, it's called simulated annealing. And the basic idea is we're going to do some version of hill climbing where we kind of bounce around in the search space randomly. Uh, but we're going to sometimes go in a worse direction, um, especially at the beginning as we do our search. And then after a while, we're going to be like more conservative and try to optimize uh, to where we are at the end. Um, so to see how this works, we're going to switch to a different problem, actually. So uh, this is hill climbing curve.py. All right. So this is an example. So, so let, me, let me show you the code for this. Hill climbing curve.py. So this is basically the same algorithm, essentially, that we implemented before, the for loop. And we're jumping around in the state space. The cost function is defined by this graph. All right. So we're trying to find, this is a cost function. We're trying to find low cost. We want to get down into this corner over here where it goes down to 0. Um, and we're going to, it's a continuous space. And if we were really doing this, like, right, we are not necessarily right. That's, that's wrong. <laughs> um, if we were going to do this, um, we could do this really efficiently by exploiting the mathematical structure of this curve. We could take the derivative. We could set it equal to 0. We could do crazy math. Um, and, and that would solve it much faster than any of these algorithms would. But the reason I'm showing it to you is because there's lots of domains where we can't do derivatives and set them equal to 0. And this is a good model for those types of domains. OK, so we're going to use not, the, not the, the correct algorithm if you were going to really solve this problem, but it's a model for other problems we'll talk about towards the end of the lecture. OK, so here's our hill climbing. Uh, and we're going to do this while loop. And we're just going to um, get the successors, which are moving a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right of the current state. And then we're going to check if the cost is less than the min cost. And then we're going to stay there and go. So what is our hill climbing going to do in this world? Yeah, where is that going to be? All right, let's try it. Um, and I've got a raw input here, so every time it loops, it's going to it's going to um, wait for me. And this, the MPL dot scatter is drawing on the graph, so we're going to see where it goes. Um, so every new red dot is where it goes, right? So it's going to kind of go down, down, down. Whoa, why did you do that? <laughs> did I run the right thing? What's that? Yeah, I'm confused. Oh, you know why? Because I think because, hmm. let's see. Yeah, I put random restarts in this code before class. <laughs> Because I was thinking about showing you guys that. So I apologize. Um, so maybe I'll take out the random restarts. <laughs> random restarts are a good idea, right? So they, they uh, make your algorithm work when it, it wasn't going to work. Let's see. All right, this is without random restarts. Let's try it again. OK, now it's stuck. OK? 
Um, and then what I just commented out down here was a random restart code. So, so that was why it worked. I did it in the wrong order, I guess. Uh, I think it's easy to show if it's broken, and, and then you show the solution. So like, um, the random restart stuff is basically saving the best value and then starting over again. So this thing right here is randomly picking a new state. Um, and it got lucky next time, and then it went all the way down. Uh, so you got to see that work. Maybe I'll switch them. Let's see. So we'll switch random restarts back on, and we'll see. So now it's going to stop searching, and then randomly restart. Now it got unlucky, right? So it's still stuck in the local minimum. And now it finally gets there um, to the end. Does that make sense? So random restarts can be very nice. Um, so the other thing that we do want to do besides random restarts is all these algorithms, random restarts is a good idea. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is decide to make moves that aren't so good. We're going to decide sometimes that we're going to go away from the optimum, uh, from, the, from the lowest cost solution, from the lowest cost point that we found so far. Um, so for simulated annealing, it, it, it looks kind of like hill climbing, but we're going to have this temperature schedule. So the people call it um, temperature because like at, at high temperatures, the molecules, your search states is like bouncing all around, there's lots of entropy, and then gradually, uh, and you're likely to make these moves that, that increase the cost, right, that, that aren't so good. Um, but eventually, you lower, uh, as your algorithm runs, you're going to lower the temperature, right? Things are going to get cooler and cooler and cooler until they're frozen, all right? Like, like, like cold and frozen, the molecules aren't moving around very much. And you're going to just only make moves that optimize uh, where you are. So wherever you got to, you're going to try to um, find the local optimum of, of that region, and then you're going to stop your algorithm, all right? So the temperature schedule up there um, is basically running until the temperature, and again, you just run until it, it stops. So run until t equals 0. Um, pick a, a randomly selected successor. So you're not going to iterate through and find the best successor. We're just going to pick a random successor. We're going to look at the difference between the value of this successor and the value of the next successor. And based on that difference, we're going to decide um, prob to probabilistically accept the, uh, uh, these negative moves. So if the value is, if the, if the state, if the next state is better, we're definitely going to do it. If it's greater than 0. If it's worse, with some probability, we're going to do it anyway. OK? And that's going to allow it to sometimes, especially at the beginning, make these negative moves. All right. So let's go to simulated nearly new dub high. And I think I left this one in an incomplete state, so it won't work when we run it. Um, so I have some stub code for this, so we don't, we're not starting from scratch. It's going to be in the same um, curve that we were running before. So the red dot is the start state, and the, the plus is, is uh, the successor that it picked. Um, and it's just going to, in this mode, it's just going to always stay at the start state and sample different successors. So here, here's the code. So while true, this is all drawing stuff, so you can ignore it. Um, it's going to sample a successor. So random.choice is going to randomly pick from the successors. It's printing it out. And then it's plotting it. Um, and then I don't know why it's sleeping. Take that out. And then it's uh, going to, oops, it's going to wait. OK? And I set a temperature schedule. So, so here we're just going to sample. We're just going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and never accept. So what do we have to do to complete this algorithm? Here's the pseudocode. So the temperature schedule is getting passed in. It's a list. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so we want to find delta E. How do I compute that? Somebody else. So successor dot cost, I think is what I said, minus current dot cost.
cost. All right. Oh, this might be confusing. I think I think I'm using cost and it's using values. If delta e is greater than zero, right? Yeah, maybe you're right. Let's try that. Then current equals what? Successor. Successor. Yeah. Else. So now what are we going to do? Tell me in words before we talk about the code. So we need to commute this probability, right? So what's that like doing? Yeah, right. So as t, so you can see the probability value is dividing by t, which is decreasing over time. Um, so we're going to raise uh, the probability value to that. And so it's going to be something that is really small. So t is going to get really big. It's going to make the probability value really, really small. Right? So over time, it's going to accept less and less and less probability. Um, so, so what's this like? There's different names for distribution. Like rolling a dice. Flipping a, coin. flipping a coin. Yeah. So this is like flipping a weighted coin, right? And the weight is e to the delta e over t. And, and it's going to tell us whether we accept it or, or reject it. Um, and I actually forgot how you do it, uh, how you say that in Python. So I'm going to go. Look up in my TT. Oh, we take binomial. All right, so here's how you flip a coin in Python, if you ever wanted to know. Um, so this is going to return a Boolean value for whether this weighted coin returned true, return heads or tails, basically. Um, and we give it the weight. So how do we compute that weight? Right, so math.pow of math.e to the delta e, maybe it's negative delta e, over t. Prob equals, and then I say, I think I have to import some stuff. Import math. And I think I have to get t. So t, let's say, T equals schedule sub i. All right, I'm just going to go down my list of my schedule, which I created before. And then what? If accept, what do I do? Current, current equals successor. Yeah, current equals successor. All right, let's try it. So it's hard to know. Oh, look, it accepted. Right, so that, that's good because it's supposed to do that if the cost is less, right? So we're going to do it again. Now it's sampled to its right, so it's going to flip its coin. And it rejected, it looks like. Reject. Oh, look. It accepted. So that time it went up. It wasn't good to go up, right? Like, that's not, we can look at this picture and know where the solution is. Um, so it's going to kind of go down, and then it's, it's just kind of heartbreaking to watch when you watch it run. <laughs> It's like, you know, trying, ah, 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 and it made it. All right, and then as we keep going, eventually <laughs> it gets to the optimal solution. So these algorithms can be very, very, very tricky because of these local minima. Because in a real problem, you wouldn't be doing this. This is a one-dimensional problem, right? We're, we're doing our x left or right. In a real problem, it would be like n-dimensional, like you have five, 10, 20 different dimensions that you're jumping around in and optimizing. It's rife with local minima. Um, and it's really hard to know. Like you know, watching this, it's like, oh, look, it's getting stuck. And if only it goes over there. Um, but, but the algorithm, and, and in these bigger problems, you don't know. And the algorithm doesn't know. But these algorithms can, despite that, can sort of overcome the, these issues and, 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 and find very good solutions or, or even optimal solutions if you let them run long enough. And sometimes that means letting them run a really, really long time. 
Um, and there's lots of different uh, applications of, of this. We'll talk about some of them in, in, the, in the course, and others you'll, you'll run across as you, as you do more stuff um, in AI. So, like, so this is sort of a version of our acting rationally that isn't even deterministic. right? So instead of iterating through all the actions, we're just going to sample the actions kind of randomly. And we're going to use some, some, some of these, um, this, this sort of temperature thing. And you know, at the beginning, we're going to take really big jumps. And at the end, we're going to take less big jumps um, in order to find the optimal solution. So it kind of fits in this template still, but, but it doesn't look you know, as deterministic and as, and as nice. But the trade-off that we get for that is we can handle much larger spaces when we do this. Um, and this, so again, there's these tricks. So like randomly restarting, um, again, the simulating alien is a very good idea. Um, changing the temperature schedule. So like I spent a lot of time uh, the, when I coded this up, messing with the temperature schedule to make it work. Um, and it can be very finicky if you if you if you anneal if you if you go down too fast, you'll be stuck in a local minima. If you go down too slow, it takes forever, um, and you might you know find some really good places but not really optimize them. And and sort of get stuck and get stuck anyway. Um, it's also really good to remember the lowest cost point. So we weren't doing that, but like as you're jumping around, you might find some good places, but jump away from them because your temperature is high. You might want to go back and check them out later and and at the end and, and find the best one that you found in all of your searching. Um, so so I want to talk a little bit about examples of these types of algorithms. It's, it's, it's a pretty broad family. So you guys are going to do this in the second project. Um, the idea is you're a robot and you're bouncing sonar or lidar beams off the wall. You're trying to estimate where you are, um, and the way that these algorithms uh, do this is by kind of having lots of different possible estimates, and then they update those estimates based on the the latest information. Keep the best ones, throw away the worst ones, and keep doing that until it converges. So here at the end, it's converged to think it's in it's in that room, um, and and it, and it knows where it is. Uh, so it's it's uh, that's sort of one example. It's the beginning. It's, it thinks it's everywhere, and then it kind of explores the most promising regions. Um, another example is from computational linguistics. This is called topic modeling. So the idea is you read lots and lots and lots of articles uh, with the machine, and you count up how many times words co-occur with other words. And what you're trying to find is these latent topics. So, so here it's read the journal Science, and it's found like a genetics topic that has words like human, genome, DNA, genetic, gene, sequence, molecular, map, information. Um, an evolution topic that has uh, species, organisms, life, biology, groups, phylogenic, diversity, disease, so like all these different disease words, computers. These are all you know, the topics that are in journals in science. And no, no human created this. It just read all of these articles. And then it searched um, using one of these sampling-based algorithms. It searched for a set of topics that explains the data. So there's a cost function that they define. And, there, and there's a lot of math that goes into it. But like, it's not, um, it basically says that like, I, I'd like topics that, that have words that co-occur together a lot um, in the same article. And it tries to find a set of these topics that explains the data well. And the way that it does it is with an algorithm that's a close cousin to the simulated annealing. That we that we were showing you, I sh that we showed you, um, and then the RT example that we showed at the beginning is another example of one of these kinds of algorithms um, where you're kind of sampling different solutions and, and trying them out and seeing seeing how they're going. Um, and this is a PhD comics of the bad side of it. Like you, if you've ever seen a robot, um, this is kind of a joke in robotics. Maybe like sometimes when robots do path planning, they like. They do these really weird curvy paths. So here the robot got to the goal, um, but it maybe took an unintuitive path to get there. Um, and again, it's because we're using these sampling algorithms like RRTs. Um, they don't always find the optimal path, but they, they find a path. You know, and it's kind of an intuitive. Um, and a research result that actually just came out. This is an example from the arm problem using an RRT. It's like an overlay of like where the arm was as it was reaching the cup. And it was, you can see it was kind of all over the place, right? Like, it's reaching the cup, and it's like, hi, I'm going to get the cup. <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, when, uh, and, and very recently, a couple years ago, some researchers invented a new algorithm, which was combining A star, so you guys were, were giving us a heuristic for A star, with the, a sampling-based RRT. And what that gave was a much faster convergence towards better trajectories. 
And so when they do that, the, the overlay looks much better, right? Like they're all kind of reaching toward the cup. There, there's no randomly saying hi um, to the people, to, to people in the world. So like even using um, the techniques we've talked about so far, like combining them in new ways has led to new research results in the past few years, in, at least in robotics. Um, so next class, we're going to take a little bit of a, a different approach. Um, the reading uh, for this course, I think the textbook is pretty good. Um, and I think people learn in different ways. So like, if you learn best from the textbook, you should read the textbook and, 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 and maybe not come to lecture or watch lectures online. If you learn best from me, then you, know, you, can, you can read the textbook as needed. I'm leaving that one up to you. Um, I think it's a great resource, especially as you're doing the project, so you want to sort of see it all laid out. But for the next course, the reading is really important. So the next project, the next class, the reading is really important. So we're going to read a research paper. I'm going to ask you to read the research paper. It's already up on the schedule. Um, and what I want you to do, what, it, what it's about is an AI algorithm. And it uses uh, gradient descent, uh, so, so like the simulating alien that we talked about, to make an AI algorithm that can read instructions like these. So this is like click start, point to search, and then click for files or folders. And translate that into actual mouse movements of a computer, of a, of a, of a Windows machine, to follow these instructions. Um, so it's, uh, and it's called reinforcement learning for mapping instructions to actions. Um, so don't try to understand all the math. It's uh, we're going to cover some of it later, but I don't expect you to get it all. Um, I want you to focus on the problem that's being solved. So what's the input? What's the output? What's the state action space? And how do you know whether or not they've solved it? All right. Thank you.